Uh, welcome. This is the third talk in our session here. We've got two more after this. Um, I am Terrell Russell. I'm currently serving as the chief technologist for the IRODS consortium. And this is going to be the technology update. We've got about 45 minutes to go through the things we've done in the last year and what's coming, uh, what we see coming in the next year or so. So first off, we have had two core releases this year. We've had uh, 427 and 428. Each one, of these is, uh, each one of these issues that's listed here, 58 and 122, represent uh, a, a real thing that someone has found or tried to do and either could not do or found an issue with. Uh, so these are uh, legitimate items that have been added or uh, fixed in IRODs in the core. Uh, talk a little bit more in the next few slides about uh, kind of the direction we're moving, but uh, these are each a conversation and a, and a digging and kind of an archaeological exercise to figure out what's going on and how to fix it. So uh, represents a full year of work, even though it's only 180 uh, items here. We've got uh, the two software developers kind of on our team, core developers are doing the bulk of the work in the core, which is good. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, most of our other efforts have been towards in the, in the plugins, and then we've got a couple people here, uh, either legacy uh, commits or things that got cherry picked, and a couple from the community that got pulled in this year. In addition to the core, which of course is not getting as much attention now that we've philosophically and architecturally moved to a plugin architecture in the last few years. We've released, uh, what is that, 10, 11 different plugins, and we've worked on and released another uh, five clients, I guess. Some of these are new, some of these are not. The ones in bold here will be having their own talk or be included in a talk uh, later this week. So we will have uh, Justin talking about the S3 work uh, itself. Uh, Corey will be talking about hard links in a separate uh, talk. Logical Quotas has its own talk. Uh, the storage tiering and indexing rule engine plugins will be covered uh, by Jason's talk on Thursday uh, around uh, policy composition. And then we also have uh, standalone talks for NFS rods, uh, release 1.0, and the Lambda function that we've got now that's at 1.0. So there is more to unpack here, but uh, we have many minutes to discuss these later in the week. Uh, but these are the number of things that we have that we release every time we release the core. We are still tied fairly closely with our uh, versioning numbers. Uh, so we are getting better at that, but these are where we are now. This list is obviously not complete, but this is the list that I curate for our monthly technology working group. So we try and keep a list of active things as well as a list of things that we um, maybe move to the back burner for other reasons. But obviously 429 is front and center right now. Uh, it's going to be the next little bit. We've got uh, some work that Alan's been doing for more than a year and it's gonna get pulled in. It'll be the bulk of what 429 consists of, uh, at least the changes. Uh, 43, we've been able to uh, pare down. It's gonna have better logging and we're gonna uh, address a lot of the uh, items and inconsistencies that have kind of drifted in terms of our uh, configuration and JSON uh, schemas. So we're going to clean that up for 4.3 and make it, you know, an, another good clean start. The last time we did that was 4.2.0, and then we've been very careful not to touch the kind of the, the, mechanic, the mechanisms around uh, how our odds is installed and managed. Uh, we want to keep those pretty, pretty smooth in, a, in the 4.2 series. We have, like Jason mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, two working groups that are actively meeting every month. We've got one for metadata templates, uh, where we have been uh, working through how to define and then, of course, use um, uh, descriptions of how metadata should work in a system and then how to apply it cleanly. And then uh, authentication working group, we've recently got work uh, around making a more flexible mechanism for authentication in the front door of IRODs. That'll be on the next slide as well. We've done some kind of philosophical and deep work on the parallel transfer engine, which is a thing that may not even keep that name once it's uh, integrated. 
uh, trying to find the one true way of moving data in IRODs. We've talked about logical locking for many years, mostly around the conversation of concurrency creating bugs. Uh, so we're going to uh, fix that in the next little bit. And we've already got code that demonstrates that it's, that it's uh, behaving much, much better than it was before. Uh, next bullet's policy composition, which is uh, again going to be a talk on Thursday. Uh, Jason's been doing a lot of work on the whiteboard and we've been uh, typing things and he's been doing most of the typing. And philosophically, we're going to move towards um, breaking things apart and then allowing people to put them back together and define the policy they want uh, for their particular use cases. Uh, we've got a bunch of different capabilities that we've already released. One of them we're working on is publishing. We've been doing uh, work to get the NetCDF uh, integration that we had in the past kind of pulled into the modern era and making it available and clean for people to use. We've had a lot of interest around a REST API uh, around IRODs. IRODs itself is obviously a, an API and a protocol and the world has decided that REST is how they want to talk to most things. So we've been working on how to expose the IRODs protocol via REST. Uh, we've had a jargon implementation, Java-based implementation for a while, and it works fine. Uh, we've been looking at something that sits a little bit closer to the server and maybe even ships alongside of IRODs uh, as a proof of concept. Again, we've been talking about Metalinks uh, as a web GUI um, and how its search interface works. And uh, I know that the NIEHS has been working on this. We've had other people uh, working on things like this as well. And so we're trying to consolidate and um, get to the point where a lot of metadata is not complicating your uh, setup anymore. So uh, indexing, a first class indexing um, alongside a GUI that, that uses that would be extremely nice to have for a number of people. And of course, we've been actively developing NFS rods uh, itself and have just had a 1.0 release. We'll have a talk about that. And uh, like all good things, our testing infrastructure uh, has to grow and bend enough to test all the things that we're building. So uh, we have a distributed architecture and it turns out that if you want to test a distributed system, you have to build another distributed system. And so that's hard and slow. And we've been working on that for a number of years and we've got an update about that later in these slides. Uh, here's a slide about the two working groups. So again, um, the technology working group itself is uh, the meeting that we have monthly where community members show up and talk about what they're working on, what they'd like to see, keep people up to date with what we're doing, and just make sure we're all on the same page. And that way we can not spin our wheels uh, in different directions. Is that a metaphor? The metadata templates working group is where we're trying to standardize the process uh, of defining and then using the metadata templates itself. We've got four uh, major parties kind of working on that in addition to obviously Rinsey. Uh, and then the authentication working group is, uh, was initially brought up uh, by SURF and they wanted to uh, have a different way of holding PAM and make PAM more flexible. They may want to add a, you know, two-factor authentication or some other thing on the back end, open ID. And the IRODs mechanism was a little bit fixed. It had a certain back and forth flow. And so we are now looking at an API plugin on the IROD side to provide a different front door. And I think uh, if that works out cleanly, it would probably replace the current front door for getting into IRODs. And that would allow everyone to have a very uh, possibly custom way for people to authenticate and get in. And of course, play with existing infrastructure, which is the, the major goal of all of our efforts. So uh, kind of the big picture for why we are working on the particular things we're working on and, and that list that was a couple slides back. Uh, large, large brush to paint this. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, we've been trying to move IRODs to a plug-in architecture so that we can Put the functionality at the edge, right? So the core becomes very generic. Uh, IRODs again is a protocol, it's an API, and its job, it has one job, and that's to do the bookkeeping well about where all your stuff is, right? The idea behind that is that the core does its job, and then the plugins, and there's seven different plugin interfaces now, the plugins are where the specific code goes to speak to particular technologies or to particular other protocols, and uh, it gets the complexity 
and the spaghetti out of the middle and pushes out things to the edge and it makes it easier to test, makes it easier to, uh, uh, to allow other people to understand what's going on. And once we get to the point where everything is a plugin, the interesting parts happen out there, we can actually write code that creates policy or that, that, that is policy. And then we can start putting them back together again and building and composing policy writ large. It allows for flexibility. It also allows for a lot more power. We don't know what the next shiny thing will be. And here, the architecture allows the shiny thing to show up and be um, brought into uh, the IROD's ecosystem. So to get to that point, we've also been working on the core libraries. So we're gonna have Corey talk about that in a few minutes. We've uh, started to work on standardized interfaces, uh, very similar in large part to what the C++ standard looks like. So we are trying to make our interfaces match the standard interfaces and that way uh, developers can do what they want and in an, in an unsurprising way. And that allows us to also potentially refactor the internals of IRODs and you know, get, rid of, get rid of bugs, it's great. Two other driving forces right now are to try and make replicas, uh, first class entities in IRODs. This uh, provides a variety of uh, benefits, but one of the most interesting and recent ones is this logical locking, which Alan will talk about uh, in a few more slides as well. The last piece here is um, when put together with all the rest of this is going to change how IRODs works fundamentally, and it's uh, very exciting. So right now we've got many ways to move data uh, with IRODs. There's actually seven to ten different code paths, I think, for how things get from A to B. And we have uh, proofs of concept and demonstrated uh, performance numbers now uh, with this work that is not yet merged, but will be in there soon. Uh, we're going to start consolidating the data movement for IROD servers that are of uh, new enough age to talk to each other and realize they both have the nice things. And everything will be across DStream. So um, DStream can move all data in IRODs across uh, port 1247. It will remove overhead for the administrators as well. And this is a big deal because now particular replicas can be talked to as first class entities with a single way to move data. And we still do all the bookkeeping that we've done uh, all along. So to tell you more about all of that, we're going to bring up a few different characters here. So first, Corey is gonna talk about uh, the core library work he's done. And then Alan will talk about logical locking. Dan is going to talk about the work he's done with uh, the different, a couple different Python query facilities. And Jaspreet will talk about build and test. Do we have Corey on the line? There he is. So Corey, I will drive the slides and you get to speak. Go for it, sir. Okay. Thanks, Terrell. And um, hey, everybody, my name's Corey again, and I'm one of the core developers for iRides. I'm going to be talking to you about um, C++ libraries. But before we get into what's new for 428, I just want to go back and revisit what the goal was that we established back um, at last year's UGM. Um, that being that we want to identify common patterns within IRODs, um, these common tasks, and we want to provide standardized interfaces that simplify these things so that people don't have to go back and reinvent how they do these things across um, different pieces of software that um, involve an IRODs. And the way we started that um, journey was by introducing six new library, six libraries last year. Those are those libraries are listed here in bold, um, starting with file system, IO streams, thread pool, connection pool, query and query processor. And these um, so far since last year, we've been able to these libraries have shown to be um, a big benefit and um, you know, enhancing um, the software, as well as allowing us to fix bugs and refactor things, um, as well as provide enhancements. Um, if we look through this list, each, each of these libraries has like a bullet listed underneath it. That just basically tells us, um, this is just to give you an idea of where we're using these things. So if you look closely, like several of these libraries are used all throughout the server, through plugins, through clients, such as I commands, um, one in particular that's of interest is the IO streams library. And this library is the one that provides the DStream interface as well as a customizable transport um, interface, allowing people to um, extend the capabilities of IRIs by either, by basically allowing you to change how you want to transmit bytes um, 
And, you know, as an example, uh, or proof of, con well, as an example, um, Justin has been working on the S3 tr um, transport for IRIS, and he'll talk about that later, as um, Tara already noted. So, uh, next slide. So now that we've talked about why we're doing this and what was prevented, what was presented last year, let's talk about what's new with 428. So here we have, we've done a lot of work. We've been, we're introducing nine new libraries. So for people who are interested to do a lot of C++, C and C-based work, um, hopefully these libraries will prove to be um, very useful in what you're trying to do. So starting with the first one, we have the key value proxy. And the idea behind this class or this library is to make it simpler to uh, manage um, the key value pair type. Um, the key value pair type is a plain old, data, plain old C data structure. And because we have access to C++, uh, we can provide better interfaces to uh, manage that type. Um, this is the first of this type in that we do plan to uh, provide proxy objects for um, hopefully all of the um, old C um, style types. The idea behind this key value proxy is that it, we provide a map-like interface so it makes it easy to insert and remove and query the key value pair type um, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Next, we have the lifetime manager. This class is all about basically um, uh, re releasing the um, heap allocated memory that was previously allocated by, by these old C style types. So normally, um, whenever you allocate in C, you have, there's a malloc and somewhere later in the, in the program, there's a call free. And what we wanna do is because we're using C++ and there's a lifetime um, associated with objects, we can simply um, wrap those C data types in um, this type in the lifetime manager and it will manage, we no longer have to worry about um, the data being, the memory being freed um, at any point, we can just wrap it and it's, and the system will handle it for us. Um, next, we have the user group administration library. And what this does, it, basically, it essentially wraps the um, C interface for managing users and groups and, auto, and makes it much simpler to um, add, remove, um, you know, de determine what um, groups a user is a part of, or even um, what users are part of a group. And so that should help anybody with who, who's interested in that kind of thing. We're also providing a shared memory object class. And this, this class is essentially allows you to manage one object in um, shared memory um, and through a very, very simple interface. It also provides capabilities for um, atomically um, accessing that memory and, and, uh, and, touch, and basically manipulating that memory. An, interest, an interesting um, interface that we have here is um, the with durability interface. And the idea behind this is that we, this is all about um, increasing the durability across um, IRIS, throughout IRIS. This is not network specific. This is a general tool, so it can be used in all different types of scenarios. Um, it provides um, options for um, specifying number of retries. Um, it also has controls for um, specifying delays and like, how the delay is is multiplied. Um, this can take any bundle of um, um, operations. So basically, you can wrap this in a in a lambda or some some object that can be invoked like a function, and you're good to go. Um, the next one is the query builder, and this class is simply a wrapper around the query object that was provided um, that was introduced last year, and so it essentially um, removes the, the need for the developer to know the constructor arguments. Um, basically, you can specify these things out of order and, and achieve the same results as, as you normally would using a query object. The next three classes are interesting, and they are only meant to be used. They're only available on server-side only code. So these aren't available um, on the client like the previous classes that, that, was, that, were met, that was mentioned. Um, the first being client API whitelist. This class is um, our attempt at basically defining this client um, API, uh, basically specifying what does what is the actual client side API look like. And so 
This allows us to mark certain um, API um, endpoints as whether the client can access it or not. This class also um, supports things like being able to query the whitelist or even um, add things to it from a server side standpoint. The next one is the scope privilege client. And all this class is about is um, it, it basically automates the process of elevating um, client, side, client privileges on, within the server side. Some operations require administrative rights to um, carry out their operation. And the way we do that is by, and this class here will um, handle that for you in a safe manner. Basically, once this object goes out of scope, it will restore the previous um, um, privileges on that connection. Um, next, we also have the um, scope client identity class, and this class is very similar to the scope privilege client and that it's all about um, becoming different users. There are, there are times in the server where like, for instance, with some of the rule engine plugins, they have to um, act as, a, um, as, like an, as an administrator, and so you temporarily want to keep that code as tight as possible. And, um, this class right here allows you to do that in a safe manner as well as restore the, the identity at, at scope exit. So um, next slide. So with 428, we're also introducing a new API plugin. This API plugin is the Atomic Metadata Operations API plugin. This, the whole idea behind this plugin is that it allows you to basically send a large amount of metadata operations, um, essentially adds and removes, um, packaged as JSON to the server, and all of these operations will be executed in sequence transactionally. So this means that no, you no longer have to issue, um, you don't have to worry about invoking adds and removes one by one uh, from the client side. You can basically just package all of your uh, metadata and how you want to apply the, that metadata um, as JSON and just send it across the wire. It supports data objects, collections, users, and resources. And because it's using JSON, because everything is JSON based, it's, um, this enables us, this provides a lot of future proofing um, for the interface and in that if anything changes, primarily it will be within the JSON and the, your um, C signature won't have to change. This library is also supported by the file system library. And the benefit of using the file system library is that you're able to, it will, it takes the work out of you having to um, construct the JSON strings. So basically you invoke these um, add or, these add or remove functions and you can pass it some, um, a container holding all of your metadata. And at the bottom you'll see here's uh, an example structure of how, um, of how this is done. So next slide. So last but not least, we um, at last year's UGM, we started uh, work on an iRise API um, examples repo. And the idea behind this repo is that it would provide examples for how to use some of these new libraries within iRise. So if you're interested in that and in, in how to use some of these libraries, I encourage you to, to, to go and look at this repo. Uh, we'll, we're, trying, we're trying to keep it in line with um, what's available and we're constantly working on it. Um, if you find issues, you know, you know, contribute or in, like contribute if you're interested in it and, you know, help us make it better. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. Uh, we do have a minute or so if there's a contextual question that if anybody has one right now, or we can wait till the end. Uh, it might be a little tricky to switch back and forth with speakers at the end. So, uh, you can pop up in the in the chat. I haven't seen any in Slack right now. So thank you, Corey. Uh, we've, we do have uh, some clapping about the atomic metadata operation. <laughs> Very good. Uh, our next speaker here is going to be Alan. Are you online, sir? Hello. Yep. There you go. Take it away, Alan. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Alan King. I'm the other core developer on the iRods team right now. Um, and I'm going to talk about replicas and data objects and replica statuses um, and later on logical locking. Um, I'm going to try to go quick. So uh, feel free to reach out to me later with questions. Um, 
So as Terrell mentioned earlier, um, we are going through a process with the IROTS core code right now in which we are trying to unify how data movement works. Um, the first step on this journey would be addressing replicas as first class citizens. Um, first, I wanted to go over a definition for those who may not be as familiar. Uh, I took these straight out of the beginner training. Um, a data object is a logical representation of data that maps to one or more physical instances or replicas of the data at rest in storage resources. Um, and a replica is an identical physical copy of a data object. Um, most of the operations in IRODs right now um, have to address data objects. Uh, via some C style structs uh, that are used internally to maintain that information. Part of that struct is a list of replicas. Um, the problem that we're running into is that uh, operations which deal directly with replicas have completely separate implementa implementations for moving data from the others, and operations that deal with data objects uh, directly still need access to specific replica information. Um, as some of you are familiar with, uh, all of this has consistency and performance implications for moving data. Um, what we've realized though, through the, the development of some of the libraries that Corey has been working on and some of our other discussions is that all of these should be and are identical. That is you open a replica, you move the data, and you close the replica and finalize its information in the catalog. Um, so, making replicas a proper first class entity within IRODs is one of these steps. Um, that's going to become, as Corey mentioned, one of our proxy objects um, in the future. Uh, that has not quite been kicked off yet, but that is um, the first thing. And next, uh, we realized that the information about replicas is not exactly always correct. So first of all, when a replica is created, its status is automatically incorrect because it is marked as a good replica before any data has moved. Um, further, there are only two states that a replica can be in, good or stale. Um, and if the data is, at is not at rest, there's no real way of indicating that or differentiating it from a good or stale replica. So we came up with the intermediate replica status, which I talked about last year during the technology update at the user group meeting in uh, Utrecht. Um, you can check that talk out um, on the recording. Um, so that's great. Uh, the replica status should reflect what's in the catalog. There's only one way to move data and we're gonna surface it with a standardized, standardized interface. It's even mostly implemented. I, we actually merged it into master the intermediate replica statuses um, the other day. But what about concurrent operations on different replicas represented by a single data object? Uh, this is where logical locking comes in. Uh, next slide, please. So we came up with this new replica status, and then we realized we can use additional replica statuses to create what we're calling logical locking on replicas. So I'm gonna to try to run through this table as quickly as I can. <laughs> so you should all be familiar with stale and good replicas, that's zero and one, which uh, you'll notice the X under ILS, that is that has historically been a space or an empty blank area um, to indicate the status of a replica. Now it's going to be an X to be more explicit. Um, and what that means is that the data at rest may not match the catalog. A good replica means that its data at rest matches the catalog. The new status that we've introduced, the intermediate status um, is represented by a question mark. Its data is not at rest, it is actively being written. Um, then we've introduced these three other statuses, read locks and write locks. There are two read locks, um, one, uh, one for each status of a replica. This is so that the replica will know what state to go back into once the uh, file is closed for read. So what the read locks do is they allow multiple clients to come in and open a replica for read, but um, they are not allowed to be written to. It also maintains the status, as I mentioned before. Um, the write lock is meant to 
lock down all other replicas when one of its sibling replicas is being written to actively, that is, if it's in the intermediate state. So on the next slide, I have a big scary looking diagram that I'm gonna go through as quickly as I can. Again, please stare at this and uh, tell us all of your evil use cases because we really think we've got something here, but um, yeah, please tell us if you think of something that might break this. So as quickly as I can. We have a logical path here, temp zone home Alice foo. That's a data object with four replicas numbered zero through three. Three of the repl replicas, zero, one, and two, are marked as good. The uh, fourth replica is marked as stale. Um, what we have here is, as you move through the timestamps, um, different clients are coming along and opening the different replicas. So, you know, timestamp zero to one, a uh, replica three is open for read, right? Uh, <laughs> correct. And then um, it moves to the read lock. At, while it is still being read, replica zero is open for read. It moves to state four. Um, while those two are still open for read, replica one can open for write. Now at this point, you'll notice that replica two has changed to uh, the write lock state. Replica one has changed to the intermediate state. As we go down the timeline some more, uh, replica three is then closed. It moves into the write lock state so that nobody can open it again uh, for read or write. Meanwhile, replica zero is still open. Go to timestamp five. When replica one is closed, it's finalized, marked as good. Um, as you all know, other replicas are then marked as stale because they have not been updated. Then, unless you, you know, make it do that, but that's not what this example is about. Then we close the replica for read on replica zero and it moves to the stale state because it has consulted um, with its sibling replicas and knows that it is now stale. Um, I know that was a lot, but uh, that's what we've come up with. Again, please uh, tell us all of your evil use cases <laughs> for this kind of thing. Yes, we stared at this quite a bit ourselves. Uh, Alan, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to skip question and answer right now. If someone does have a use case or something, uh, we can come back to Alan at the end. We still got a bit to go. Dan, are you nearby? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> there you are. Take it away, sir. All right. Thank you, Terrell. I'm Daniel Moore, Applications Engineer at the IROD's Consortium. I'll be covering improvements to the general query facilities uh, that are accessible from the Python language uh, in coding for IROD's. The general uh, query is a simple uh, dialect of SQL that you can use to query the catalog, uh, the ICAT. So whether on the client side, say you're writing anything from an administrative tool to a scientific work aid, or on the service, uh, server side, excuse me, uh, say uh, implementing a workflow or crafting data policy, uh, in either case, uh, you can target these applications in the Python uh, language. Um, in the former case, the client, the client side, you'd be using the Python IRODS client. Uh, in the latter, you'd be using the Python rule engine plugin. Either, uh, in either case, uh, in both cases, which is to say uh, each, each of those has its own query interface uh, independently developed because the common thread running through a lot of these tasks is that you must determine what objects exist in the catalog currently, whether they are data objects, uh, collections, users, groups, storage resources, or the metadata values attached to any of those. Um, there have been some changes and improvements, uh, as I said, to, to uh, both query interfaces, client and server side. Um, these exist in, uh, in very recent releases within the past few weeks uh, to both PRC, Python IROD's client, and the uh, Python Google engine. A little bit of uh, history, for those that don't know, between uh, version 421 and 424, um, the query facilities on the, um, available from Python on the server side were basically a tightly affiliated uh, small set of microservices. These were uh, made into a Python iterator, a more Pythonic solution in uh, 4.2.5. Uh, 
with the most recent release of the Python Little Engine plugin, uh, we have from Mr. Chris uh, Smela of Utrecht University. Thank you, Chris. We have a new query class, which is uh, more high level object oriented and uh, generally easier to use. You can see an example of that. Uh, if you look at the upper code block, you see a sort of more verbose uh, version of a solution. And if you see uh, the solution from Chris's query class below it, you see a considerably uh, simplified version of it. Uh, the idea with this example was simply to take a like pattern, match one data object on the system and, and return its, um, its location in terms of uh, collection name and data. Uh, thanks, Terrell. Um, so on the client side, uh, we have uh, now the ability, which was always a part of IRODS, but um, until now, I think, had not been respected by the, by the PRC, but the client library in Python. Um, now you can add a keyword, uh, giving uh, the name of a federated uh, zone in which you'd like to search for objects in this example above. Uh, code block above, we're actually searching for data objects that are less, uh, that have been modified more recently than the last, uh, last hour. Uh, below, you can see um, an example of a new in operator, which again was part of the general query syntax all along on the outright side on iQuest uh, commands, for example, but it's now been added uh, into the Python uh, rods client. Next slide. Um, lastly, uh, we now have the ability to query the same uh, column name. Um, going to be careful there how that's what, what you're saying there, but um, a good example for applying this is that I'm going to direct you to the lowest part of the slide first because what we're doing is we're querying for data objects where two metadata criteria are being uh, satisfied at the same time. And this is actually a direct, more direct and simple syntax you see down there. Um, above in the highest code block on this slide, you see the PRC example. And this is much the same as it was before our improvement in, over the past year. But the difference now is that uh, we, we actually don't stomp the previous criteria <laughs> when we're introducing new criteria. Uh, up until this release, the last release of the PRC, you would have seen the last criterion dominate and the others not being, uh, previous ones not being respected. Questions? Very good, Dan. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. Uh, Jaspreet, you are up. Are you here? I am here. There you are. I make, you got to go a little quick. Go for it. Okay. Hi, people. This is Jaspreet Gill, and I am the automation engineer for iRODS Consortium. And all the fancy things that uh, Corey and Alan have been working on cannot be released if they don't test it out. So I am kind of responsible for the iRODS build and test infrastructure. And currently, we are on the seventh generation, and it uses Jenkins, Python, and Docker. Next slide, please. Most of you have already seen this slide from the last UGM. If not, I can talk to you about this offline, but for with this architecture, what can happen is that uh, the developer and the production infrastructure is going to be identical. The developers can have their own personal Jenkins and use it to test their changes before creating a pull request to the main repository. Uh, next slide, please. In the past, I have made several prom promises and out of those promises, I've got completed five of them and three are still pending. Uh, I had promised last year that I'm going to parallelize the jobs, which I have not accomplished because this particular structure is still in uh, production, uh, being still created or is still in progress. Uh, continuous integration is not happening because, uh, like I said, it's still uh, in uh, uh, being created. And make iRods Jenkins public again. Yeah, that's my main aim. Uh, so 
let's see when this is going to happen. Next slide, please. So for the build and test uh, of 428, uh, we basically have the ICAD database running in its own uh, container because in production, most of the time, ICAD database has its own um, machine. So we decided that it should, it should have its own container. And we also moved into serialized workflow uh, because we found out that Docker by default creates max 31 networks. We are still learning about Docker and all, we also hit into a GitHub rate limit exceeded exception. If you are not authorized, then you get this particular issue. Um, the operating systems that we supported for the 4 to 8 release cycle is Ubuntu 16, Ubuntu 18, and CentOS 7. I have also tested 4 to 8 on OpenSUSE, and I'm currently working with SEL, SLES to add the official um, container into our CI. Uh, databases supported are Postgres, SQL, MySQL, MariaDB, and Oracle. Number of core test suites as per, per OS per database that last I counted are 65, and I'm not going to go through this particular list. This slide is, will be available to you. So next slide, please. Um, so in the future, like I said, make IRO Jenkins publicly accessible is my main goal. And you guys have already seen this particular slide every UGM since I've been part of uh, IROGs. The main thing that we added is con conformance testing. So for example, right now Sanger is upgrading from 4.1.13 to 4.2.6. And if we, with this architecture, we can probably, um, we, are, we are pretty flexible to add more, um, test their use cases, and then they can be happy with what we've done and upgrade more easily. Um, I think that's it for me. If you have more questions, you can always hit me on Slack. Thank you, Jaspreet. I will go quickly, we've got a couple minutes. so. Uh, again, big picture is that with all of this new technology that we've kind of put into 4.2 with the first class replicas and the new libraries, we will be able to rewrite, we're estimating 80-90% of the internals. Um, this will allow us to be more confident and reduce the amount of code that's in the system. Uh, this allows us to refactor and go faster without breaking anything. Externally, it allows us to put smaller uh, pieces of functionality into tiny, tinier boxes as well, and then of course be able to compose them back, which is what we're going to talk about later with the policy composition. So continuation within the rule engine plugin framework is itself uh, another piece of the talk, but it will allow administrators to, again, break apart those policies and allow those little bits of policy to play well with each other, even if they don't know, um, you know, the other policies that are involved. The whole point is that they, they don't need to know because they've been put in a well-behaved well-defined box. So this is our graphic from uh, our uh, data management model. So we've now released code for five or six of these. And uh, Jason will show that we think that the last few will also just be a bit of JSON now at the end. So uh, we are getting close to meeting our uh, multi-year vision here. And uh, this is very exciting for us. Uh, Again, 4.3 is really going to be about hardening and polishing and making sure that all of the kind of constituent pieces around IRODs are behaving. We've started working on different kinds of clients and heard from different, uh, different groups around file system integration and onboarding and uh, kind of ease of deployment from Nurov. So uh, in terms of a, a, the one true IRODs command, we will continue building out policy components. And the idea is that IRODs really does become a conversation between you and your administrators and maybe your users, but maybe not about policy design, composition, and configuration. Uh, the, the coming and the going of, of how IROD is doing its business should, should no longer be really the concern of, of the users, right? Uh, please continue to share your use cases, hopes and dreams. And this is how you get involved. We've got working groups. We've got GitHub issues. 
obviously, you know, in the end, the speaks the code speaks, uh, but we are perfectly willing to have public conversations on the, the Google group. And of course, uh, uh, once you're serious and this is real and you want to dip your toes in a bit more, uh, consortium membership is the way to go. And please uh, talk, teach, publish, cite, all of these things. I'm going to look over at Slack real quick and see if we've got uh, a couple of questions. Uh, questions about race conditions should be handled by what Alan uh, demonstrated or uh, illustrated here. Um, the gen query file that Dan mentioned does come with the Python rule engine plugin. So it, the genquery.py shows up in Etsy IRODs. And let's see, we've got a question about GSI plugin. So I'm not sure we'll have to take that probably offline. And I believe that's about all the time we have. So uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, of course, we'll have continuing conversation uh, in Slack this week. We have a troubleshooting session on Friday and uh, hope to have everything answered by the end of Friday so we can all sleep. That'll be great. Thank you. <laughs>